This will be a discussion on uh, fake news, the European elections, and democracy. For better or for worse, these three terms are in one line, and they are very um, in everybody's mind these days as we move to the European elections. And there are some political forces from both sides of the aisle, but mainly from the far right that are, uh, for some of us, endangering the European project. So uh, we'll hear from the Commissioner for Digital Economy and Society, Maria Gabriel. Um, and then we'll hear from uh, two or three distinguished journalists, two of them from uh, Belgium dash France, and one from the US, and one from Greece. I said two or three because the Greek part is not anymore a journalist. She used to be a colleague, and we used to be in summits together. Now she's a member of the European Parliament, which is a very interesting transition, and allows her, I think, to give us a perspective both as a journalist and as a member of this body that will be tested in May. Uh, naturally, we'll start with the Commissioner. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, it's a great honor for me to be here with you today uh, to discuss this so important topic. I would like to, to start by saying that uh, we all know that disinformation existed now for many centuries, but what is new with this phenomenon that they are spread and the speed. So what is important now is to start by saying very clearly that disinformation weakened the democratic debate, destabilizes political action of public authorities, and the most important for me, undermines citizens' trust and institutions and media, even between us as citizens. As a European Commission, we try to put this topic very high in our agenda but I would like to start by saying what are our red lines. Red lines is to preserve our fundamental principles, which are the freedom of expression, the media pluralism, and our right to access of information. That's why we don't want to establish a ministry of truth. truth. We are not in favor of any measures favoring censorship, but in this framework, we don't exclude some very concrete actions. That's why I would like here to emphasize four of them. First, since one and a half year ago, we already said it very clearly. There is no miracle solution to tackle this challenge. All of us, we have a role to play. There is a responsibility for platforms. There is a responsibility for member states, for journalists, for us as citizens. I would like first to put the example of our code of practice for tackling disinformation online. Premier, first initiative in the world where platforms together with social media, but together with journalists and civil society organizations agreed to take measures, very individualized engagements. Now, until the elections and the month of May, the monitoring will be monthly. Every month, we'll evaluate the progress of the reform because remember, the code was done in September and in September, I said it very clearly to platforms, it's a chance for you. Show us that you are responsible, that self-regulatory measures can work and now every month, we'll see what is the progress. What is the progress on a very concrete indicators? What's about fake accounts? What's about the sponsored content? What's about the political advertising and the transparency? What's about tools at the disposal of, of citizens in order to make their informed choice? Because when we talk about elections, is that that great moment where we take informed decisions, we make our informed choices, and we know that this information and after Cambridge Analytica, especially as an example, we know how much this information can change our perception of the reality. That's why now I would like to say it very clearly. We just started with some measures on behalf of Google, Facebook, and Twitter, 
but definitely is not enough. I would like to see more concrete examples. When we have applications, all those applications have to be at the disposal of, of all member states, for example. Very, very concretely, we have an application context button on Facebook, which is at the disposal of only eight member states. And we all know that fake news and disinformation don't know borders. So what is important now is to have all those applications for all member states. Another important, uh, important critic for me, for Google, Facebook, and Twitter, when we talk about political advertising and uh, pol political uh, content, they link this content only with political parties. No, we know that political purposes are pursued not only by political parties. That li that's why, for example, I will be very vigilant to see what's about the scope of this, of this, of this ambition. Something important, not only the code, but in parallel, we are working for the establishment of a European independent network of fact checkers. We just start the work because there is fact checkers in only 12, 13 member states and we all know that their work is an important part of this ecosystem. So I insist here on the word independent without any interference, not from the European Commission, not from member states, that will be an important criteria. In parallel, third measure, I would like to insist very much on that. It's about media literacy. I really believe that it's one of the key elements if you'd like to achieve more, more results. That's why I'm very proud that now, uh, in the month of March, in the week between 18th and 22nd, we'll organize for the first time a European Week of Media Literacy. That's my wish. It's to give visibility to the work of journalists, to history teachers, to civil society organizations, because they are tackling this challenge every day on the ground. Now what is important is to raising awareness everywhere in all member states in order to to see how together we can really do more on this on this topic and final final measure i would like to insist here on the responsibility of member states because in december we published our action plan and now by the month of march every member states have to designate a national contact point in order to establish a national rapid uh, a european rapid alert system what does it mean is to have a platform where member states are exchanging in real time information. If there is a threat for the integrity of European elections, what is the origin of this threat? So now we are looking very much on member states and we already uh, received a lot of designations. They have not so much time. That will be really important, especially because we are planning to make an exercise in April in order to see what are our strengths, what are our vulnerabilities, if we are enough prepared for, for, this, for this. So I would like here just to share with, with you that for one and a half year ago in, a Euro in the European Commission, we are taking this topic very seriously. I'm very glad because when I started to raise this issue, I was a little bit alone. But now, thanks to the great support of journalists, of the European Parliament, of the institutions, we, we, can, we can say it very clearly that it's one of the biggest threats for our democracy. Remember, in our Eurobarometer, 83% of European citizens are saying that disinformation online is a threat for our democracy. It's a quite huge percentage. We don't know so much studies where we have this, this very, firm, uh, very firm declaration, especially because we all know that disinformation is not about only about elections. It's about our society. It's about the health of our children. It's, it's about the environment. That's why it's so important to not only to talk about this topic, but to continue to promote concrete measures. My conviction is, again, there is no miracle solution, by, but if we continue to work together, if, you, if you, we stay mobilized at different levels, 
And if at the center of our approach, we keep the freedom of expression and our fundamental values, we can really give more visibility to quality news, quality content, and reduce the visibility of fake news because it's impossible to, to make them disappear, but we have all a role to play in order to minimize the impact of this phenomenon. I would like to stop here. Thanks in advance for your questions, suggestions, and ideas. Thank you. <coughs> Commissioner, thank you very much. And now we'll move to um, our colleague from Belgium, I think, or France. How should I uh, describe you, Christine? I think from, uh, sure. from Paris. From Paris. And I have to note, and although most people think I'm like 20 or 25, I am a little bit older because I remember uh, her in the 80s. I happened to be in Paris for studying. And I know, I know. She was like a young, upcoming, and uh, in both. Antenne 2 and TF1, I think, different French stations. She was the face that people would go to to hear the real news. So many years later, it's, I think, worth uh, listening to her experiences on this sensitive subject. Uh, thank you very much. It's quite a Is this uh, yeah. working? Yeah. Um, yeah, let's be discreet about the time, but anyway. Uh, these years were indeed the golden age of um, uh, broadcast journalism. And uh, first of all, things wouldn't uh, happen as fast as they do now. I think sp speed, electronic speed, uh, has made uh, the news business uh, extraordinarily uh, dependent upon the technology and also uh, extraordinarily shallow because even for the best uh, intended people, there's very little time to bring uh, uh, depth or context or historical, uh, basic historical notions into anything. I'm talking about, uh, again, electronic journalism and of course the 24 seven news patterns have uh, indeed uh, made that very obvious. Nevertheless, uh, it, it, there's no point in saying it was so much better before. Uh, that's really a sign of old age, once you start saying that. <laughs> so we have to live with uh, the current tools, uh, which are also uh, uh, extraordinarily, uh, an extraordinary improvement uh, when it comes to sources, the spread the spectrum that anyone can have access to. But uh, I was very uh, glad to hear the commissioner insist on the idea that uh, in our democratic countries where people do not appreciate enough that blessing compared to other places, we, we have to draw the line uh, when it comes to the, the freedom of expression. And of course, it's the most difficult issue. Uh, in those countries uh, which have a, a very legal uh, um, uh, habit, I mean France is a champion of making laws, uh, Germany uh, passed a law and uh, France is indeed in that process too and it's very embarrassing uh, for the news corporation uh, because, I mean, who's going to tell that, uh, you know, this is okay and this is not okay, mm -hmm. because it certainly shouldn't be any government official uh, or even an independent body uh, where people who get appointed there sometimes, not always, but sometimes, don't have the most basic clue about our trade. So it's a very, very uh, dicey line. But uh, I think that uh, education and uh, training people indeed to filter the kind of news or the kind of information they, they have access to, which means it has to start at school at a very early age. I think education is eventually the best shield. But that will not prevent uh, it's, uh, whoever uh, wants to infiltrate and indeed influence uh, the, the, the forthcoming elections in all our countries. 
And in, in that respect, of course, the Ukraine is very much a test case. Uh, as indeed, uh, it's probably the, the, the most uh, obvious and uh, 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 shocking uh, exchange of fake news over the past few years, and, it, and, and it's the most so uh, dangerous, as indeed uh, people's lives are at stake. When it comes to elections in more stable countries, I think that uh, not even uh, mentioning what happened uh, during the 2016 election in the US, uh, I remember during the French election, the last one in 2017, there were obvious attempts. Uh, and and uh, of course, and, and Robert Kaplan mentioned that in his uh, very interesting talk uh, earlier this afternoon, the problem about these kind of attacks is that it's very difficult to, to name names uh, and to say, oh, it's definitely coming from such or such a place, but still, you know, uh, there are signs. And so it, it's, it was obvious uh, two years ago that indeed it was the case during the French election. Uh, from uh, what I've read recently, I think there was a piece in the Financial Times two days ago, uh, indeed the uh, the Commission, but also the European Parliament, uh, are trying to take measures uh, in order to limit, not to prevent entirely, but to limit the, the, the danger, uh, which is very diffuse. And there again, uh, the problem is that lies tend to be much more fun than facts. Uh, we saw that again uh, recently with the Aix-la-Chapelle uh, treaty, it's not even the treaty text that uh, Madame Merkel and uh, Emmanuel Macron signed not too long ago, and uh, immediately in the, in the French far right and in the Gilets Jaunes, the story was that Macron was selling uh, the Alsace to Germany, which, I mean, it, it gets to be so ludicrous that you, you sort of pinch yourself and you say, people can't possibly believe that. Well, the problem is that they do, and there's a whole uh, vacuum of uh, not only ignorance, but just a desire to accuse, uh, obviously, the system, the elites, uh, to lie to the people, that indeed it is a very, very uh, difficult and messy exercise. So my last point would be that for us uh, journalists, it's, uh, we, we see in many uh, news organizations, but of course, Stephen will talk about that much uh, more uh, in much more detail than I can, but it's interesting that fact-checking has become indeed a new dimension uh, in the newsroom, uh, not always on the websites, uh, but at least it's a beginning. Thank you very much. We'll go to the third uh, <clears throat> speaker, and I'm not uh, kidding because I said what I said about Christine and being in Paris as a student. <laughs> I was in Boston before that as a student, and I was reading Stephen at the Boston Globe and then the New York Times. So in that sense, I know both of them. So Stephen, please. It's very kind of you, thank you, and it's a great pleasure to hear that. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I'm Steve Erlanger, I work for the New York Times for decades now. I'm now based in Brussels, I've been lots of places, including Moscow, Paris, Berlin, Bangkok. Um, and I agree a lot with what's been said already, um, but we are vulnerable. Democracies are vulnerable. And I think we need to really understand that. We think, you know, it's a constant state, that it's the end of evolution, that it's the best possible system. Well, it's very vulnerable. And if you look at, if we're talking about the European elections, Democracy has already been in trouble for these elections. Turnout has gone down every year. There have been European parliamentary elections. Um, everyone talks about that. We had an interesting panel this morning, partly about this, about you know what the democratic deficit in the European Union means. But the European Parliament is a strange creature. I mean. I mean, it is, it's a strange creature. Ambassador 
Chisholm knows this, um, but as my colleague Daniela Schwarzer said, no one belongs to a European party. They don't have a party structure. You have all these elections that are sort of national elections in which people vote on national issues. And then sort of afterwards, the elites kind of cobble together coalitions. Um, and that's the European Parliament. Now, maybe I'm being a bit unfair, but this has not energized European voters for decades, right? And so when you take this, this very vulnerable system already, and then you attach new challenges, I think one has to really pay attention. Because Mark Twain once said, you've probably heard this, that um, a lie races around the world while the truth is still pulling on its trousers. And that is true. And that's a problem. And once it's out there, it's very hard to pull it back. Fact checking is wonderful, but it's very much a post facto thing sometimes, particularly for, the, for um, social media. The other point I, I want to make in a way, you know, I'm just making obvious points is there's, propaganda is not illegal, right? There's nothing wrong with propaganda. It's a point of view. We've had it for many, many years. I mean, it's been, you know, long before the protocols of the elders of Zion, there have been fake news. The question now is technology, which makes these things first far less transparent, far more available, and cheap as hell, right? I mean, it's really cheap. You put something out on Twitter or Facebook, you get millions and millions of potential views at co no cost, really, essentially no cost, the cost of your internet connection. So this has changed things, and it's very hard to, to keep up with it. And I admire government institutions and the commission who are trying to deal with this, but they're always going to be slow. They're always going to be behind the speed of this technology. Um, and the other thing I would say is we're learning something about, um, you, you know, it's not just Facebook, but let's talk about Facebook for a second. I mean, it's not that old, first of all. I mean, it was for college kids to be in touch with one another. I mean, the people who, who, who started or were very involved with it, like Google, I mean, they thought it was all for the good and it would benefit mankind and it, you know, it's like, you know, like um, universal literacy was good. It was gonna bring the communist revolution. And in fact, as we learned, it, it, it brought advertising. That's what universal literacy brought. So everything has a kind of downside. And Facebook is, you know, let's be fair. It, yes, it's for information. It is also a rapacious private company. Hugely powerful, hugely profitable, um, which, you know, has other interests than the general good. And it sees itself all the, as like a highway, right? Like we're a highway. We're not responsible for what travels over us. I mean, it could be a child's carriage. It could be a nuclear weapon. That's none of our business. We're just a highway. But actually, it's a utility. It's a utility like the telephones, like the electricity. It needs to be regulated. It has only under begun to understand that it needs to be regulated. But given the size of it and the speed of it, I mean, half of, I mean, what is it, a billion people are on Facebook? I mean, it's completely absurd. You, how do you do that in different languages, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, there's a challenge to all of us. So that's the other thing. And again, freedom of speech, it is not illegal to lie in public, right? That's not the problem, right? It's freedom of speech. So then I think, you know, I also have to admit I am an American and I come from a country where my current president um, seems to make no distinction between truth and falsehood. I mean, he uses whatever he feels like saying at the time. Um, he's the one that says everything is fake news, particularly what we do, what the Washington Post, what 
you know, so-called mainstream journalists do. The failing New York the Times. Failing New York Times. In fact, we're, Trump has helped us. I mean, we now have 4.4 million people who pay us every day to read us, so we're not exactly failing, but it's clear what he's doing. I mean, he's using us as a kind of puppet in his Punch and Judy show. That's a game we can't play. And he's also trying to undermine the credibility of what we really do, particularly when it affects him, by claiming that everything we do is not just fake, but it's partisan, is anti-Trump, is elitist, is, is aimed at, at dismissing the people um, who are his base. Um, in, in a way, he wants us to be what Brussels is for the populists, right? It's, that's it, you know, we're the elitist, unthinking, um, gender bending, much too liberal, a thing that doesn't represent the narod, the real people. Um, so that's the other point. Now the other last point I'm going to make is that, call it fake news, call it bots, call it manipulation, of elections. I mean, these things are pressing on real issues. And I think it's wrong of us not to pay attention to the issues on which they press. And these are issues of inequality that have grown a lot, of racial injustice, of migration, of, of stagnant income. You know, you know the whole list. I'm not going to go through it. But, you know, the whole point about bots is like anything that works. The point of them is to create division and insecurity and mistrust in institutions. And um, it's not just Russia that does this, by the way. Parties are doing it, you know, to themselves and, and, and to their oppositions. And they're making claims about candidates that are wrong and so on and so on. So I think we need to be very careful about somehow blaming external instruments, even though they may be there for touching on issues that are internal and divisive and already exist and are not being dealt with properly in our own democracies. Because as I say, we have a democratic issue, an issue of democratic um, deficiencies quite separate from fake news. And then truly the last point is, I'm a little less worried about things like Facebook and so on. I'm much more worried about local language bots and, and websites in the Slovak language, in the Polish language, in Czech language that are playing on, on, on divisions in, in these societies. Um, they may be coming from the outside, they may not be, but you know, just looking at what's passing us by in English or French doesn't really get to the heart of the real problem, which is what happens um, in this clash of values and, and legal understandings going on today in the European Union. So I will s stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we're moving to Maria, who has a presentation. So she will do it from the podium, I think. Thank you. Thank you. I have a presentation. If you could facilitate me, please. Oh, sure. Well, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much, Tami. Allow me to start with the fundamentals. We are here to discuss about the European elections. And what are we afraid of? We are afraid of the rise of populism. And is it something new? The answer is obvious, no. Populism has been around as long as authoritarianism has been. 11 out of 33 countries in the EU have governments which include populists, and there are other countries, four other countries, that populism offering parliamentary support to the government. It is the Populism Index from Timbro, Authorian Populism Index, it is this year's publication. Well, more than half of these parties have been founded prior to 2000. What there are common characteristics they, ha they are left or right. The first characteristic is that they present politics as a conflict 
between people and the elite. They represent the people, one people, and they are fighting the elite. And they insist that they are the only representatives of the people. Second characteristic is their impatient with democratic procedure. This is expressed as a lack of respect of the division of powers, one of the fundamental characteristics of liberal democracy. And I think that you have all read the, how democracy dies, and it states as a lack of institutional forbearance. Of course, the authors in this book describe populists are undermining forbearance for a strategy of winning by any means necessary. They would like to win, and they can use everything to win. And this includes no respect for democratic procedure, as all the study describes it, it is majority rule without speed bumps. The third characteristic of this populist is the vision for a state with stronger muscles. The reasoning for creating a state with stronger muscles is either the fight against the elite, it is the first characteristic, or even worse, the fight against the minority which has been vilified by the populist. And I want to make clear this. According to this study, these parties came here to the European Union, to the member states, and came here to stay, not to leave. It's not something one-off. Could we say that their emerge is related with the increased circulation of fake news? Fake news is something that is creating a sentiment-driven approach on events which fits perfectly of the rhetoric of populists for a fight against an elite. Everything is against the elite. Everything is a fight against the establishment. This is the case for them. A key enabler in this process is the declining trust in the traditional media as a part of the establishment. Time and myself, we know what traditional media means in Greece especially. The phenomenon of fake news, of course, is not a new one, and I would like just to remind that the so-called myth of suicide of Marcos Antonius is in fact fake news. He has done something like this. But what makes fake news in our current day and age so potent? First is technology. Technology has enabled the collection of a large pool of data, which according to Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, has been weaponized against us with military efficiency. This technology has created algorithms that condition people only to hear the things that interest them. It is something like a bubble, and we are inside the bubble. And we hear only opinions, we hear only news that it is inside the bubble, and nothing out of the bubble. This inevitably creates that political analysis called as echo chambers. It is the official term of the for the bubbles, which result is no real exchange of views at any level of political discourse. Instead of an agora of ideas, and allow me to use the Greek language, agora, ideon, Technologies enable polarized ide ideological silos, which are fed by fake news, and this is the issue that we have to address. Do people realize that this problem is getting worse? As the Commission already mentioned, according to the Eurobarometer, 83% of Europeans think fake news is a threat to democracy, whereas 73% of internet users are concerned about misinformation online in the pre-election period. Especially in our country, in Greece, more than half of Greece believe that every day of almost, or almost every day, they are confronted with a piece of information that either misleads them or about, it's a fake news. And as Churchill said, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on. So, what can we do as politicians? First, under the leadership of Commission Gabriel, and I would like to say that we are very honored to have here here in Delphi, the Commission has taken some brave steps to tackle the problem, but there are to do more. You know, the Commission has already mentioned that the market leaders, Facebook, Twitter, Google, according to the latest Commission report on the code practice against disinformation, are underperforming. They are underperforming, and we have to know it. We should to, not only to rely on business to adhere to their commitments, we have to do more. And allow me to conclude with this. We have to do more by investing in people. Investing in people and starting with the next generation of citizens that we must encourage for a social mobility mechanism. 
we need to add the pillar to Erasmus, address the high school students with a focus on increasing tolerance and encouraging exchange of views at all levels. Second, we have to empower people. We have to use technology as a tool of widening the knowledge of people and not narrowing it down. We need to help them. We need to help people to break their free from their ideological echo chambers, from their bubbles. Third, we have to reskill people, middle-aged people. We have to give them the light. In the fourth of industrial revolution, we must prepare our citizens and our businesses to be resilient against the rapidly changed landscape of jobs. Allow me to say that I believe that the next narrative of populism will be people versus robots. And we have to be ready for this, and we have to be ready to address this. And of course, fourth, and I think it is important for all of us politicians, is self-regulation of political leadership. I would like to give just an example. In Germany, the democratic parties have agreed not to use bots during political campaigns. And there is a no one only party that is not part of the agreement, and it is the alternative for Deutschland. You can understand why. I would like just to conclude by saying this. We have to encourage people, we have to invest in people, we have to understand that above all, we are human beings. And we have intelligence, we have emotional intelligence, we have physical intelligences, and we can combine all them. We can understand what is going on outside this room, what is going on in our state, what is going on in the European Union. And finally, we have the final say. Thank you very much for your attention. Let me uh, start the discussion process by asking all of us, all of you, since I guess everybody one way or another mentioned Google and Facebook and Twitter, I'm just wondering, do these uh, social media networks, platforms, do anything or do enough to correct the problem? And if they don't, which I assume is probably the answer, but you can answer that for yourselves, uh, should the states uh, the Parliament, the European Parliament, do it for themselves because there we are on a very fine line, which one way or another was mentioned about freedom of speech. So, are they doing enough? Are they being pushed to do things, and should they be pushed? Let's start with the Commissioner, and I would appreciate everybody's thoughts on that. I was I was very very clear with Google, Facebook, and Twitter, which are signatories of our our code. It's not satisfactory. It's far below from our expectations. Yes, on one side, they just started. Very concrete example, this first monthly report for January, Google removed more than 46,000 fake ads accounts. And for the first time, we have a clear picture in which country, how much. First, UK, second, we have Estonia, third, Romania, we have a very clear data because one, one, one single point, we can't advance without data. And platforms and social media have those data. So we have to insist on the inclusiveness of this process. On the other side, we have some advancement. I already mentioned the example of Facebook, Facebook with context button. Some of them started with training for journalists, more than 1,000 journalists in January, for, for Google, more than 300 for, for Facebook. It's not enough. What I would like to see now, it's clear indicators, something measurable. What's about the number of fake accounts? Because we already know that there is more than 90 million fake accounts on Facebook even now. So what's happened? How we can identify how, what is the mechanism of their spread, how they work? Something very important, they already started in preparation for the elections to, to have more transparency in their ads policy. For example, they will, they will ask if you are a European citizen, you are in a member states. But one important thing, in March they already promised to start to ask who is sponsoring this advertising. That's a very concrete step, and I would like to see to see results. So definitely, for the moment, it's, it's not enough. For the moment, there is good intentions. So some, somehow, I would like really to, to, to tell them, 
Um, our patience, uh, it will be by the month of March because some of your measures, that's the deadline. But after, we are ready to, to strengthen some of, some of our actions. At least that was our approach. You give, we, we give you a chance to, make, to, to show us that self-regulatory measures can work. If it is not the case, I think that we have to be ready to propose some regulatory measures included. Before I go to our colleagues who will give the journalistic uh, angle, let me go to Maria and see, ask if the European Parliament is doing enough no. on that issue, on the social media um, outlets. It is, it is important to, to explain that uh, there is a, a kind of, uh, of a different pace. The players in the digital era are moving very fast and we are moving very, very slow. And it's not a, 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 an issue that it, we face n only in the, at the EU level. We have to have a kind of a global agreement, a kind of a global approach in order to proceed. Otherwise, we will have something like GDPR. GDPR is a significant step forward, but it's just for Europeans. And if the whole world will not adapt something like GDPR, then GDPR with, uh, Europe will be an island of protecting personal data, but nothing else. I think that the same means for, for, for Google, the same means for Twitter, the same means for Facebook. That's why I insist that we need something like global cooperation, that we need something, a global agreement on, on telling the, the, the key players in the digital era that it is time to follow the rules. That's what Avas is calling GDPR for democracy. It's time to have it. Uh, Christine? Nick Clegg, who was a, an European uh, member of parliament for, for many years, uh, would have now become uh, in charge of, I think, public relations for, for Facebook. Uh, it would be interesting to know uh, how he combines uh, these two experiences. Uh, because let's remember that uh, Zuckerberg didn't even bother uh, to come and address the, the House of Commons. He, he decided that it was beneath uh, his, uh, his importance. So I think we, we shouldn't be naive about the way uh, the GAFA uh, plus Twitter uh, would, would be, you know, willing uh, and of course well-meaning uh, and as, as uh, Stephen uh, put it, uh, you know, they're not in philanthropy. They're, they're, they're in two business. It's exactly a year ago that the scandal of Cambridge Analytica uh, burst out. Where is Steve Bannon these days? Remember that Steve Bannon, who by the way was on the board of that uh, company, uh, threatened uh, Europe. He said, oh wonderful, what a wonderful place to have fun because you're going to have these elections uh, in May 19, and so let's get ready and, and let's play. Well, it would be interesting to know where Mr. Bannon uh, now uh, is and what kind of uh, money, what kind of te technology, what kind of means uh, he has, because of course, let's not fool ourselves, Cambridge Analytica may, may have uh, collapsed, but immediately the same people created exactly the same kind of company uh, under, under another name. Uh, and the, the third point I, I'd like to make is that, of course, you have uh, these huge companies uh, and uh, of course we in Europe are always seen as uh, being over regulated but I was very surprised to hear Robert Thompson who is the number two guy of the Rupert Murdoch empire Murdoch not really being a fan of the European Union well Thompson telling me a couple of months ago wonderful what you are trying to do uh, at the Commission level and at the European uh, Parliament level, uh, and we, we're pushing for that. And so, you know, I said, well, uh, why don't you ask your own president? I mean, Donald Trump. Uh, and it seems that th there is even in, in Washington DC, in that very erratic system, there's the beginning of uh, 
uh, a sort of uh, idea that maybe you know uh, the big uh, newspaper companies, the big media companies, uh, would act upon the administration. And of course, depending on what the Mueller investigation eventually uh, shows in the coming weeks, it will be interesting to see uh, uh, the depth and the intensity of that uh, technological penetration of uh, the democratic process in the US and of course where it has all come from, although we all have a pretty precise idea. Stephen, and actually, can you add uh, a little bit, elaborate a little bit on the U.S. and what Trump did and what the situation is there? You know that you talked about it before, but how does the Congress deal with it? I mean, there was a moment, I think, when a senator was talking to, I'm not sure, one of the big guys from the companies and said that uh, if you don't correct it, we will, which brings again the question of in a free democracy, do you do that? Do you interrupt or intervene? Um, as I say, these are very, very difficult questions, partly because of the size, the speed, and the variety, and the lack of transparency, and the cheap cost of turning out junk, right? I mean, um, social media, in my view, I've argued it in the opposite way, because I was asked to at the Oxford Union. But social media, I think, has been good for democracy rather than bad, right? I mean, it has brought a lot of information and a lot of interest to a lot of people. I'd be curious to know, and maybe the commission or someone will, would be looking at this, you know, whether it helps turn out this time, right? Because here, you know, We've, we've just seen the sort of Timberg figures, which are quite good, but you know everyone's worried that, as usual, the passionate turn out and the good lack all intensity, and you know populists will come out and vote, and other people will, as usual, go never mind. Uh, now, how much social media can change that? I don't know, um, but. In general, I think it's good now to regulate these things. Self-regulation isn't going to work. It's, you know, it's something. But as I said, these are profitable companies. And this is expensive. Self-regulation is expensive. Having all these fact checkers, these are people, right? Now, I'm sure they have algorithms that help to, to, to decide what's a fake site. I mean, even I can tell you hints on what's a fake site. It's not so difficult. I mean, usually somebody that doesn't have very many followers, right? Uh, anyway, um, and has a very kind of handsome picture, usually, taken from an advertisement or something. Um, but I think just relying on these companies to undermine their own profits enormously by self-regulating really won't be enough. I do think governments need to be responsible for hate speech for identifying hate speech, because there are laws against hate speech, particularly in Europe. Um, but this requires people, not, and people are expensive. I mean, salaries are expensive, and it requires people who actually have an education, who kind of know some history. It's, it's a very complicated problem. So I have no real answer for it, except in general, I think the benefits of all this outweigh the detriments. And you know, places like the BBC, you talked about education, are trying, doing experiments in schools to try to teach kids what's fake, what, how you identify fake news as opposed to regular news. My problem is I would like people to actually pay more attention to news. I mean, the number of people who are actually reading the news and keeping up with the news is quite small. I mean, some days I don't blame them at all, <laughs> you know? But um, this is, as I said from the beginning, more a matter of our own problems, our own education, our own difficulties in making it clear to people that democracy works for them, right, and not just for parts of society. And that has nothing to do with regulation, that has to do with the way we practice politics. 
to move a little bit away from fake news to populism, the one touches upon the other, of course, I was wondering, do the elites, because Maria mentioned the elites, and I think, personally, I think that's maybe the major problem. Both in Washington and Brussels, the elites have lost the people, to put it simply and bluntly. And it's shown in so many elections from Trump, Brexit, elsewhere. And I was wondering, is there enough self-criticism or self-realization by the elites themselves? Because if you don't do that, then you wouldn't be able to fight the beast. Or do you think it's the other side's problem? Well, I mean... As part of the elite, you can ask. Yeah, of course. I would just okay. ask everybody to be really yeah. brief yeah. because we're down to the last yeah. two and a half I minutes. mean, East Coast, I believe... East Coast, I, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm a rootless cosmopolitan. Exactly. I should be hung, hanged. Um, look, I think people are aware now much more of the problem. I mean, what happened in 2016 in America was a shock and people weren't prepared, and the government wasn't prepared, and the electorate wasn't prepared, and it made us much more vulnerable. That was true of Brexit also. Um, that referendum, which is still fuzzy, by the time you got to the French election, Macron called it out from the beginning. The Germans, you, you know, had already seen the Bundestag had been hacked. Um, the defenses are up, and even we just reported, I'm sure we weren't alone, but for our midterm elections just a few months ago, um, we blocked um, a Russian internet troll farm the day of the election and prevented them from putting stuff out on social media. So that defenses are up, but you know, it's, it's very hard to control. Uh, somebody else just 30 seconds so because we'd like to the last minute down to the last minute yes but allow me to say just two words actually we have like one or two minutes more because we're 54 so I think we can um. one more than what I see <laughs> okay oh. so populists I think that they are now trying to create the new establishment so we have to have another perspective we have to ask for roadmap we have to ask for for for, for arguments we have to, to, to ask for for keeping the rules. And this is for me the main argument that we have to use. In this perspective, I think that the elites, it's something quite old. The new elites are emerging and are coming from populism. Salvini is a part of the elite. He was a, a colleague of us, a colleague of uh, uh, Mrs. Gabriel, a colleague of mine, previous colleague of Mrs. Gabriel, a colleague of mine. He was walking, he was, he was walking down the streets during the, the night of terrorism, and he was taking pictures, and he was, he was giving life from, from spots in, in Brussels, and now he has in his hand the, the destiny of Italy. So it is important to explain, but this is a kind of old-fashioned procedure, and I think that we need, the only thing that we need, it, it is its principles and its rules. And, we'll go to Christine and, and maybe, maybe to oh. insist a little bit more on some narratives okay. which are touching our emotions because this information is so successful because it touches our emotions. We all care about the health of our children. Example, this information on vaccines. We all care about the quality <coughs> of the air and the water. That's why environment in the second most successful topic. Migration, European way of life, politics, our fundamental right to participate. That's why I think that one of, one of the important things is to change the, nar the public narrative and to, to, to present that more in order to touch the daily life of people, to align more the ag our agendas. It's not always the case. I you want to make a point or uh, <laughs> just quick? <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me just add, that as a journalist, I hope we are close to the day where people will read things and believe them. It's a hope, and let me end with hope, because as Jesse Jackson said, we should keep hope alive. Thank you very much, and uh, going to the next panel.